This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Carl Tatt's Design, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now through Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. Back in the day, you know, it was like you mix a song a day, right? You spend the day, you leave it on the desk, you come back in the morning and you make any tweaks and then you print. You know, that kind of workflow doesn't really exist much in my world, but I always find that when I put it down and then I come back to it the next day, I can make five moves in about 10 minutes and have like a significantly better mix. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you are rocking a Mac Mini M1 in your studio, then you should definitely check out the new OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Hub Expansion Solution. It's the perfect size to seamlessly stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or old Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at macsales.com slash rockstars. Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound hi Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your, your pant leg. leg. Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Ben Rubin a producer, mixer, bassist, and composer in Brooklyn, New York. Whether he's melding hip-hop and jazz with legends like Master Ace and Donnie McCaslin, playing upright bass at the Newport Jazz Festival with Dred Scott's trio, remixing Karsh Kale or Wu-Tang's Kill a Priest, rocking on electric bass with Marshall Crenshaw, or producing Peter Bernstein's solo jazz guitar. Grammy-nominated producer, remixer, bassist, and composer Ben Rubin, a.k.a. Benny Cha-Cha, is renowned for making records that are pure or genre-bending, or both. Picked seven times as rising star producer in Downbeat Magazine's International Critics Poll, Ben has well over 100 album credits to his name. Lately, he's been working with a diversity of artists, including Queen Esther, Eric Deutsch, Theo Blechman, as well as labels like Ropadope, Sunnyside, and Imani. Most recently, Ben's attention is focused on Analog Player Society at the Bridge Studio in Brooklyn with APS founder Eamon Drum creating cut-up hip-hop instrumental records and jazz albums released on Ropadope. Featuring legendary Juice Crew's MC Master Ace, Ben's production and mixing credits include Walking Distance, featuring Jason Moran, Grammy-nominated composer and pianist Emilio Sola, and many recordings for Small's live records, releasing more than 30 records with jazz greats, including Tim Reese, Roy Hargrove, Mulgrew Miller, Seamus Blake, and Cyril May, to name just a few. As a bassist, Ben has toured and recorded both upright and electric bass with a diversity of artists, including Dred Scott Trio, Patti Smith, Courtney Love, Mary J. Blige, Moby, Bill Frizzell, and his own acclaimed genre-bending band Mudville, which my brother Nate Shaw actually played in many years ago. Isn't that right, Ben? Didn't Nate play with you guys yes, for a while? Yes, sir. He sure did. And yeah. he ran his SP5000 and... It was nuts. Nice, man. That's when we met, actually, too. So we'll we'll get around to That's that. That's right. <laughs> so um, Ben has also composed scores for features and short films, including director Nelson Kim's feature film debut, Someone Else, which premiered at the Miami International Film Festival in 2015. 
Very cool stuff, dude. A great diversity of music. Please welcome Ben Rubin to Recording Studio Rockstars. Ben, Ben Cha-Cha, Benny Cha-Cha. Are you ready to rock, dude? Yes, sir. I am ready to rock. All right, Thank you so much for having me, Lidge. Yeah, thanks for being here. And what a great uh, bio you've got. Just so many cool projects you've been working on. Thanks for being patient with me while I did my best to (laughs) to get that read right. Hopefully, I edited it together perfectly. Um, Sounded good to me. Yeah, thanks, man. Great to have you here. Give us a little bit of an introduction to who you are in your own words. You know, just a short one. Um, You know, I, I, I met you, what, 25 years ago? Is that right? Maybe like 15. 15? Okay, 15 years yeah. ago. All right, cool. 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. Like mid, mid 2000s. Yeah, that's right. When you were playing with Nate, but you've just done a ton of stuff so, since then. You know, I've been back and I'm a native New Yorker. And then I went to college at Oberlin in Ohio and lived in the Bay Area in the 90s for a bunch of years. And that's where I met a lot of people that I still work with today, like uh, Dred Scott and Mudville. And I could think of probably 70, 80 musicians that I used to play with in the Bay Area that all moved to New York around the turn of the century. And so, yeah, about 2000, I moved to New York and mostly just at playing bass, mostly just as a bass player. You know, that was always what I wanted to do is just be a musician and play instruments. And as I started Actually, right before I moved to New York, I st- I got a I think I got a Digio two maybe and you know one of those blue and white G threes, <laughs> and I think that's really when like home recording really seemed viable, right? I, you know, I've got a that, backup. I got a, a blue and white G three sitting over here. If you need a backup, man, if you need a secondary. Well, when I need to it. go back to seven point <laughs> four, I'm going to be giving you a call. Actually, I really still miss seven point four, but that's a topic for another day. Um, and so I started working on records with, you know, the bands I was playing in, uh, like Mudville, my my band with uh, singer Marilyn Carino, and I started mixing records for Dred Scott, who I started playing with in, I don't know, 1997. And, you know, I'd be mixing a record or two a year and doing some producing. And uh, I spend most of the mid-2000s working on Mudville and trying to get that band going. And... Um, Never really happened. That was a lot of heartbreak. Put put our heart and soul into those records, and we're never yeah, able to sell yeah. them. Um, they're cult classics now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, man. Well, that's unfortunate, man. You must be the only person I've ever known who had a band and tried to get it off the ground, and had any <laughs> trouble with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's a rare. It's a rarity. <laughs> um, anyway, when I go back and listen to those records, they still stand up. And you know, that was kind of my recording school. I went out and. Um, Around 2000, right when I moved to New York, I started playing with Chris Brown and Kate Fenner, who are uh, renowned Canadian musicians. And they actually were uh, joined the Tragically Hip for a couple of tours. They're like the biggest band in Canada for anyone who's not aware or were for a really long time. And so we went on the road with the hip and played all over the U.S. and Canada. And at one point we went to the hip studio, uh, the bathhouse in on Lake Ontario there. And I met Ken Friesen, who's this incredible engineer. And I ended up mixing both of my records with him. And that was kind of my recording school. I never went to school for it. And, you know, I just learned what everything did. And, you know, that was back in the like song a day, leave it on the desk, come back in the morning yeah, days, totally. <laughs> which, um, I don't really miss. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, so that was kind of my intro to recording and mixing. And then, you know, it's people, more and more people started asking me. And then 2009 was when uh, Spike Wilner, who was the owner of Smalls Jazz Club, uh, started a label, Smalls Live. And it was literally what it sounds like. It was recording bands in the club. So I would bring in engineers and produce and, and mix these records. And Now, which one is but, Smalls? Is that is that in Brooklyn or is that over on Manhattan side? That's in Greenwich Village on West 10th Street. Was that the down? Uh, did I might have gone there once with Nate, where you have to go down the stairs into the and it's sort of you long go downstairs basement. and you you turn a, you make a, a quick left. That's Smalls. There's also maybe you're thinking of the Village Vanguard. No, nah, um, it might have been Smalls. And then and then would you like bring your own? They'd have juice there, and you'd bring your own liquor and mix your own. Oh my god! So you went like 
to the old smalls. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> you are dating yourself. <laughs> there was a that was the old smalls when uh, Mitch Borden owned it, and yeah, that they didn't have a liquor license, and people would just play. You know, that was. Yeah, I saw when, Brad Meldow trio. There. I was going to say Brad Meldow, Kurt Rosenwinkel, you know, a lot of those folks were playing there back then. And then it shut down for a while and then it reopened. Someone else opened it and then Spike bought and it felt like Smalls was gone. Like it was such a such a um, hub of the community. And then Spike bought it. And as soon as the, the day I walked in after Spike bought, it, I was like, oh, wow, Smalls is back. And it was like this feeling. I don't know how to explain it. Um, anyway, so he asked me to kind of you know, oversee the production of all the the records that we were doing and 30 something records and like a million jazz greats later, I had like kind of a big catalog of records that I'd mixed and just kind of kept going from there. Yeah. Awesome stuff. And we've got a link for that rock stars. We get, we got links for all the stuff that Ben's doing in the show notes, but there's one of these is a playlist house of cha-cha. That's the name of my studio. Yeah, which is great. Um, and so that um, so there's a bunch of beautiful recordings that you did there too. So Thank we'll have you. to check those out, rock stars. So that that must have been a lot of fun. Keep going. I want to talk, come back and talk about this stuff, but but let's keep hearing a little bit about what else you've been doing. You've done a lot more since then. Sure. Um, so let's see. Right around the when the small stuff was ending, that was when I uh, I started having children. So that's really kept me at home. Um, I live in Brooklyn, but I kind of feel like I've been trying to maintain the Nashville hours and be home for dinner every night with the kids. And, um, I think it's definitely better for making records also not, you know, um, immersing yourself in eight hours on one song just seems like a mistake to me physiologically, if nothing else. Um, so since then I've just been working with all the great musicians who call me up, like, uh, Walking Distance is a great example. These guys uh, were some younger New York guys, Caleb Curtis, Kenny Pexton, Adam Cote, and Sean Balthazar. And they're like, we haven't, I'd already mixed a record for them. And we've just been talking about like how to tell a musical story, especially with acoustic jazz music or acoustic improvised music. Um, how do you tell a story that's not just like a photograph, which is what a lot of, jazz records have been over the years and that's fine when your musicianship's on that level that will carry a recording for sure <laughs> you might have to but, you might have to break that down a little bit more for us so when you talk about the difference between a story and a photograph for a jazz jazz album what does that mean to you sure so the idea with this record was we were going to take really like a rock or pop approach and have each song is its own world right so it's not like many records you go in and the the song the sounds are the same from song to song and and the world is the the playing and the composition itself right but my my contention was that you know that's that's like a 1960s 60 aesthetic you know and in the last six years, there's been a lot of recording equipment and recording techniques that have been invented to help change the emotion, tell the story in different ways, and really uh, bring the listener through an adventure and have them feel something in addition to the song. There's, Like I said, there's nothing wrong with jazz musicians just playing their songs and you know, there's many examples of that working really well. But with Walking Distance, first of all, they based all of their compositions off of Charlie Parker. So we called this the record Freebird. And uh, they used a bunch of arbitrary composition techniques like playing a song backwards or taking a note inventory and writing a new melody over the same chord changes. And a bunch of different things like that. So all these songs were derived from Charlie Parker and wouldn't exist without his music. But much of it doesn't sound a whole lot like Charlie Parker. So my idea was let's treat every song differently. You know, one song, everyone was in the same room around a single 47 in Omni, right? Some songs, everyone was in a booth. Everything was super dry and totally processed in the studio later. We did things where the drummer, Sean, and Jason Moran, the pianist who we brought in to play in a few songs, 
And if anyone doesn't know who Jason Moran is, they should go look him up. He's one of the best pianists in the world. He runs the jazz department at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and he's uh, a musical scholar and an art scholar. And he came in and just he was just the icing on the cake. But um, so a couple of songs. I was having the engineer, uh, Aaron Nevesi. We did it at the bunker in two days. And I wish we'd had one more day, but we, we had Aaron did like, I think eight mic setups in two days for us, which is just kind of bananas. You know, this wow. is not a record that would have gotten made without a spreadsheet. Well, I'll say, nice. I'll say that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, that's Aaron true with most be, movies too, probably. Right. Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> so he was feeding me like the drums into a space echo and I was playing space echoes live while they were playing. And I was playing effects while they were playing. That's awesome. Just to have that improvised vibe, you know, that, my whole thing about recording is it's just got to be something new. It's got to be something that's never been done before. You know, if it's been done before, I don't see a reason to do it. It's already been done and people are going to go seek that out, I think. Hmm. So, you know, I thought of a bunch of these songs like movies, you know, like there's one song called Big Mint that's I feel like it starts off in a like 1930s Berlin bordello or a beer house and then it it opens up into this, you know, maybe goes from black and white into color for this one section and then it goes back. You know, it's just like there's so we basically I was in the band for that record and I, I got my own bird mask to prove it. And um, and uh, the production was on the level with the playing and the, com the composing. And we came out with a really great record. It was in the New York Times top 20 records of the year that year. And that's awesome, man. I'd say one of my crowning achievements. That's great. Um, and that one, I think we do have in the Spotify playlist, right? Yeah. So I'm that, sure. so rock stars again, uh, check out the playlist. If you want to listen to these different tracks while we're talking about them too. And you can uh, pause and come I back. guess you have to pause, listen, and then pause and come back again. Good way to do it. Good way to do that. And I'll encourage you rock stars. There's probably going to be a lot of, um, note taking worthy info on this one. So, um, as there are in many of the, the uh, episodes, so just pause the podcast for a sec, flip over to your notes app, jot it down and come back. That's a good way to remember all this stuff. Um, well, that's awesome, dude. Uh, did you guys record that all over at the bridge studio or at your house of cha-cha or how, like where, where would you record we, something like that? We did the, we did the basic tracks at the bunker in Williamsburg which is another great studio and they have lots of toys and I uh, can't remember if they had the Neve in the A room at that time. I think they might've had the SSL, but whatever, they got plenty of great gear and a nice room. And so we did the basics there and then we did overdubs over here, like more horns, tuba, um, weird percussion. And over here percussion is in the bathroom. Ha house of at Chacha. the house of Chacha, my, my, my Which little mix place. room over here. Yeah. Sweet. Now, um, the bridge studio is another place you work at as well. Yeah. That is a beautiful room. Also in Williamsburg that was built by my friend and musical partner, Eamon drum. And it is a huge room and a beautiful sounding room. And if you're looking for a big room now in New York city, it may be the biggest except for maybe power station. Wow. Before your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs and notes in one place. But setting up a shared cloud folder can be frustrating. There's always somebody in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Not so with Samply. It's easy to add collaborators to a project so the whole band can upload new songs and make comments before the session. Just upload your voice memo or mix and start collaborating. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at samplyaudio.com or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. Okay, cool. Well, tell us about your place, um, House of Cha-Cha. You've got a, you're sitting, like what it looks like you're surrounded by some cool stuff. We don't have video on the podcast, but I can see a little bit of it. 
you might have amps and gear and like, yeah. what else? What are I you got, looking I at? I got the mixing gear in the front. Well, I, you can't really see it, but over here is my like, here I can, actually I can show you. Well, you can just tell us because we're not going to be able to see it. I know, it. but I'll show you because you want, <laughs> you like this stuff. That's so, true. So uh, Make sure you tell us too. Yeah, yeah. So I got my Neve 8816 that I mixed every, I've mixed everything through for the last probably 15 years. Awesome. Does that have the, uh, the widening knob on it too? The, like, it sure does. Yeah. That is a good, it's a good button and a good knob that gets a lot of use. And we then like, we like good knobs on this podcast. Good knobs are a good thing for sure. Then under that, I got my night pro EQ 3d, which is the pre precursor to the mog EQ. Oh yeah. It looks similar. Yeah. Um, before cliff, I guess changed the name of the company or started a new company. And then I got my warm audio 76, which is great. And my ultra harmonizer H 3000 DSE. Oh yeah. And I got, um, under that is a great secret piece of gear. The, uh, Ibanez SDR 1000 reverb delay unit, which you can get cheap on eBay all the time. And it's, Sounds amazing. It's I, I'm told it has a chip made by Sony in there, and I don't know why it sounds so good, but it does. What was that? Then, the three thousand or something? The SDR one thousand Ibanez. One thousand. Cool man. They, they they break fairly frequently. I think that's my fourth one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep buying more. They're not really worth fixing. Um, then behind me, I got. Uh, some more stuff. I got my little Chad Blake tribute section up at the top over there. I got the Sans Amp and I got the Hughes SRS AK100 sound retrieval system. What's that? <clears throat> it's some like stereo, stereo faker thing that was made for TVs in the 80s by Hughes Air. Uh, Aircraft Corporation. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, if you, if you go on a uh, gear space we're calling it now um there's plenty of threads about it and chad talking about it as well um, w what does it do it like makes things kind of stereo it's like a, or it's something like a, or? yeah it's like a stereoizer nice um and then uh, and it kind of what it does do is it makes stuff jump out of the speakers so background vocals i like to use it on a lot stuff like that it like kind of puts it in front of the speakers that's cool that so like blend fun. some of that in and also you got to run it through the uh 504 Buenos Noches on uh, the the harmonizer as well. Um, that's, <laughs> okay, cool. That's the signal path. I hope Chad's not upset. I'm giving up his secrets. Nah. Uh, let's see. Then I got, I don't know, I got a distressor, a couple of DVX 160s. Um, and then I got the ADR scamp rack, <clears throat> which is um, a modular system similar to a 500 series. Um, it's the same one that the Kepex Gain, Gain Brains and the uh, Valley People Dynamite. I think. Oh yeah, I got, a, I got a rack of Gain Brains and and Kepex Gates. And so the the EQs are just like the vocal are the vocal stressor EQs, and I got two uh, compressors that are Compex pressors compressors. Nice man. And uh, I got the the Pan unit, which is a Pan Man, and uh, Pan Scan. Excuse me, and. Uh, those things are cool. You know, your, ele your electric, electric bill must be going up there in Brooklyn, having all that <laughs> stuff. So if you need a if you need a new place to just kind of store it, I'll host it for you down here at the studio at the Toy Box. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good to know. That sounds like cool stuff, dude. Um, and then in the back, I got instruments, you know, Fender Champ, Ampeg B15, MPC 2000 XL, Wurlitzer that I just had refurbed and sounds incredible. Um the Roland U20, which I use as a controller, and I bought it after I sold my JX Roland JX3P that I got for my bar mitzvah. My only regret in life, I think, <laughs> is selling that JX3P. <laughs> um, that's funny. I think that's the know, one we used on the Hide Your Mama's record I just did. I think it was a Roland JX3P. It's a keyboard, right, right with the little yeah whammy knob it, on the on the side there. Yep, and it's got a little little controller box. It could have been the 8P too. I think was maybe a little more popular than the three. Yeah, uh, I think you might have forgotten there? to mention an upright bass. Oh, oh yeah, there's an upright bass right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an important piece of gear for you. Important piece of gear. I got a uh, let's see, realistic concert. Concertmate MG1, which is actually a Moog Rogue. 
Oh yeah, that was man! Sold that's by like, Radio Shack. Yeah, I, I totally know that. <laughs> in fact, I got the plug-in version of that recently. I don't remember who the the maker is, but it was really fun to play yeah, around with. It's it's um. Oh my god, I can't remember is either. It cherry but, audio, cherry or audio, like that? cherry yeah. audio. That thing sounds great. It yeah. sounds just like like mine's kind of broken, so I've just been using the plugin. <laughs> yeah, but also even when it's broken, sometimes you turn it on and it does cool things. Yeah, like the siren effect comes on. Do you remember that they also made a sound <laughs> effects machine that like wasn't a full synthesizer, but it would just um, play sirens and other cool things. Here it comes. It may, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That was a long time ago. You know, got to have, got to have some toys. Got to have some toys. All right. So, so you've got all this cool gear out in the outboard racks. Talk a little bit about how do you actually use that in a session? Is the only way you use it to put a microphone and go through it and record it that way? And if you forgot to, you just don't use it? Or do you use it where you have a process where you'll take stuff that you just recorded straight in and as part of your mix process, you'll go out, process it, reprint it, stuff like that? I don't use much of the outboard gear when I'm recording. Um, there just doesn't seem to be any reason to, because you can just do it, do it all later, unless you want a specific sound. You know, sometimes people want a specific sound, and then you got to choose a specific compressor for that. But I just try to go clean on the way in. I have. Oh, I didn't even talk about my preamps. I got a. Uh, I don't have any of the normal preamps. I have. Um, I have an Ampex 351, which is the f- the front end of an old. Tape machine. Uh, Ampex tape machine. That sounds, it's just, I call it butter. Just sounds yeah. incredible. It's tube, and right? It's tube. It's the same. If if anyone has the Kramer Master Tape plugin, that's this. That's the same thing. Oh, cool. S- same piece of gear. So it overdrives incredibly well. Um, oh, I also forgot to mention my Dynacord Echo Chord Mini tape delay, which sounds awesome. Nice. It's like a tape delay from, German tape delay from the 60s. Um, I also have... <clears throat> Two uh, show and tell, I guess so. Two, show two Telefunken six six seventy sixes that I rescued from Nora Jones's storage closet, and I have a couple of Ward Beck M four seventies. Oh yeah, They're the called Canadian the Neve Neves. of Canada. Yeah. yeah, the Canadian Neve, and they sound great. I don't think they sound anything like me, but they sound great with with the EQs. So you know try to make those choices with microphone and, and preamp, and then you can just do anything else later. I mean, there's just the possibilities are limitless now, which is terrible, but also right. great. Right. Right. <laughs> Definitely a challenge trying to figure out what to use and when to stop using it, you know? Yeah. So when I just, to. you know, if, if a sound's not doing it for me, then I just run it through another piece of gear until it's doing it for me, you know? So I, I don't honestly don't use that much of the outboard gear that often these days the plugins have gotten a lot better since like when we met say yeah 15 yeah, years ago yeah so like you know i always think about the um the al schmidt quote rest his soul um no one's ever listened to a record because of the snare drum sound are we sure about that i'm trying to think if i, I mean ever and, have. well you know no, i know what you any mean, listener you care about <laughs> yeah yeah exactly no. I mean, well, what about when I, uh, um, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of anything right now, but I think you're right. I mean, it's true. Yeah. The, the, the gear is a really fun part of making it and it's part of what gets us excited about it, but it's not the reason why we discover the song in the first place. We might, we might learn to love that snare sound afterwards. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So, you know, and having I, limitations is a good thing. I don't think I ever thought about a snare sound until I started making records. Right. When I was just yeah. a listener, I don't think I did. I do mean, you when remember, I mixed, do you remember that? Do you remember focusing on the sound of instruments when you were just listening? No, not, not specifically. I really just try to feel the music, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that, that informs my approach to mixing. You know, I'm, I'm a really, I try to be a top down mixer as much as possible. Like, You know, I start on the mix bus and do a bunch of stuff on the mix bus, like at the beginning of my process. And then, you know, if I got to go into the individual tracks and solo, you know, I definitely do. But, um, you know, as a producer and a mixer, your job is to be the proxy for the end listener, the person who's just listening on their phone or in their kitchen or in their car. And 
those people are not listening to music like that. So that's what you really got to keep in mind is like connecting to the listener and keeping them engaged in the song for your three to five minutes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's harder to, to do than it seems sometimes. And it's easier to do. It's way easier to say than do. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, very cool. So let's see, let's, um, what do I want to talk about next? But I, uh, just to get back to it for a sec, because I don't want to go too far away from it. We're going to come back and talk about all this gear stuff and studio stuff because it's fun. But yeah. with all these recordings you did, like at Smalls, doing these live recordings, um, you've done a ton of jazz recordings in the studio now. Talk about you know what you learned doing live jazz recordings in a club that ultimately could translate to a great mix like you've done so many times, and maybe even how you ported that into the studio to continue what worked so well in a live setting or change things up better for a studio? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, well, you learn a lot about phase relationships uh, doing live recordings, especially at Smalls when the, uh, the piano's like, piano mics are like two feet from the cymbals. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And, I mean, like, you know, those were tight spaces. So, you know... Really, I'd say what I really learned is that when you have great musicians, it almost doesn't matter. And it just, the music just comes through. And I don't know how to help anybody else with that. And I've just been fortunate to work with a lot of great musicians. But um, you really got to trust your band. And all those bands were just super prepared. You know, they're ready to go. They know their music. Um, so... Really what I learned about that production-wise is really just how to set the table and make sure that everything's working and that the musicians can just focus on playing the music, you know, because musicians um, can be insecure and, you know, worried about stuff. And the less things, the fewer things they need to worry about while they're trying to make a record, the better. You know, that's why I always encourage people to not produce their own records if possible or mix their own records. Like, they just don't have the perspective to do it. And, yeah, basically, basically, you the job of the producer in those type of situations where you have really high-level musicians is just to get everything set up in a way where they can just open the floodgates and let the music out of them without having to think about anything else. If the if the artist is also being like, is this getting recorded right? Then you got a problem. But yeah. I know when they get there and they're like, okay, Ben Rubin's back there. We're cool. They don't think about it. They stop thinking about it. Just me just being there helps them to stop think about it, thinking about it because the musicians trust me. And part of that comes from me being a musician also. So they, I know what it's like to be on the other side of the microphone and... You know, I can kind of play both sides of that fence. and Plus, Ben's just comforting. playing with a, a roll in space echo the whole time anyway. So. Yeah, it's, it's all over those <laughs> so, live um, jazz recordings for sure. <laughs> nice, man. Well, you know, it's funny because I just spent all weekend in the studio with friends of mine playing and having help from my interns, you know, as they stepped in as engineers. And so I get to experience that other side of the glass thing. And I completely agree with you. Like, when I'm playing music, I'm terrified just before every take that my first note is just going to suck. It's just like the beginning <laughs> of the take, the beginning of the song is just going to be terrible. It's going to be the wrong tempo, the wrong too feel. Much. It's going to be all that. Yeah. And it's like, it just needs to have this flow where you just get into the music and you, you, it's almost like a great, um, tracking moment or recording moment is when you, you sort of wake up and the song just ended and you just realize, oh, we just recorded it. Yeah. Well, that means you're in the flow state and that is a hard place to get to, but if you can get there, you know, then, then you've, then you've done it. And, you know, I feel like after three takes, there's no chance pretty much. Hmm. So, you know, I hear about records where they did like 30 or 40 or whatever takes and you're just like, okay. I even don't, even the Beatles know. were doing that. I think a lot of takes. Yeah, I think so. I think they were yeah, doing, going up to guess 50 so. on some of that stuff. Maybe they were doing variations on the the whole approach to the song at times, but they were in the studio for six months. 
Well, you know, they had a lock on Abbey Road Studio B, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so that's cool, man. Um, and I I think that's great to hear. So, so basically, like, you know, if I hear you, it's like the live stuff is, like you said, I love that analogy of setting the table. You're just getting everything ready so that you're ready to go. You're ready for anything. And then that focus on making sure the phase relationships between you know, all, all the mics is really working because y- you're not really doing lots of fader moves on a record like that. Probably it's more like just make sure that yeah. this collection of mics uh, is great and as opposed to sucking <laughs> as a combination, you know. Well, one thing I also learned, I guess, now that you're mentioning that, is that it's interesting to learn which musicians really know how to play a room and which don't. <laughs> because, you know, yeah, there weren't a lot of, there were some fader moves. I would boost a solo here and there, of course. But um, great bands know how to mix themselves, you know? Yeah. They just know how to mix themselves. So they're getting louder and softer on their own. And, got to try to respect those dynamics as much as possible. I'm not saying I didn't have a, a bus compressor on. I did. But, um, you know, I'm not using compressors for that purpose anyway. Right, um, right. But, yeah, it, it's interesting to learn, like, which people, and it tends to be the older musicians, learn how to play a room. And some younger musicians just would overplay and it kind of makes the whole band play differently. And I think that's just interesting. It's kind of neither here nor there, but, um, sometimes I wonder where that comes from too. It could be like a experiencing, but it can also be, you know, whether you, you, um, your experience of music evolves in a live room setting where the only way to create dynamic is acoustically by playing the room or, did your experience evolve in a setting where you're on a loud stage and everything's got an individual spot mic on it, or you're in a studio and the entire production is created with studio tools and never existed in a live setting before now? There, there's so many different ways to approach it. Um, and I think that the old school way, like the old, you know, I just, I think about like big bands, you know, recording in the thirties or forties, like, that everyone was mixing themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you just, it's something that you don't need to do as much anymore, but it's, it's a skill. And I learned a long time ago that really you're recording the room in a way, you know, like it's, you're recording the reverberations in that specific space. So when the musicians aren't getting the feedback from the room they want, or they're not, responding to the feedback they're getting that can cause more problems. So like the bands that played quieter at smalls were easier to mix, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You get to turn up the mic breeze more. It's almost like you record more of the room then because you're just gaining everything up. I think it was, um, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Oh my gosh. I'm going to blank on names today because I stayed up all weekend recording, (laughs) but uh, T-Bone Burnett. I think yes. he had a quote once about talking about the that the secret to making a great record was to play very quietly and just turn up the gain a ton on the amps, on the mic prees rather, or the guitar amps, I suppose, where it's like everything's quiet, but you really, you, you rely on the recording gear to really amplify the sound and you just get this hugeness. That makes a lot of sense, actually, yeah. for his, on based on his recordings that I've heard. Yeah. 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 The first time I heard a Carl Tatz Phantom Focus Mix Room featuring the PFM HD 1000 Master Reference Monitors, I was blown away. It was like listening to 3D holographic audio where I could reach out and touch the instruments with rock solid bass down to 20 hertz. It was awesome. And now I've got one of my very own at the Toy Box Studio in East Nashville. What's amazing is that the Phantom Focus system can be implemented in your existing control room too, or even your bedroom studio, giving you world-class sound. Go see how cool your studio could look and sound at phantomfocus.com. 
This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, Presona Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, now, what about taking that into the studio? Do you find that that's something that you like to recreate in the studio as well sometimes? Um, Absolutely. Mean, you know, and, and how yeah. is that different from like sticking people in ISO booths? Well, it, it all has to do with what kind of interactions you want with people you know, or what kind of interactions you want from the musicians. So like another good example of that, that did work in the studio is uh, the analog player society records that I've been working on the last couple of years. Right. And that's, that's the stuff that included like master ace and stuff. Yeah. Master ace, Donnie McCaslin, uh, Oren Evans, Desron Douglas, Eric McPherson, like just the best musicians I could possibly find. And um, the way those, rec that, that ended up, that project ended up being two records and the single with Master Ace. And basically, I, myself and Eamon, we wanted to make like a cut up hip hop record. But with sampling the way it is now, we didn't want to pay for samples. So uh, we brought these guys in for three hours, not Master Ace, just the band, Donnie, um, who... Uh, Donnie's band was uh, borrowed by David Bowie for Black Star. If any rock stars aren't aware of that, um, so it, that was his band on Black Star, and Oren Evans and Desron and Eric. And I brought them into the studio. I asked them to play a couple of standards. I told Eric, I asked Eric to play boom bap, like a boom bap vibe on the drums, not just like a regular swing vibe, and. Then we just let them go. They played a couple of, they played like the same song three or four times each. And uh, the bridge has a, a, a great phrase, always rolling. So like Eric would just be practicing and stuff between takes and playing incredible stuff on the drums. And the bridge has the best drum booth I've ever heard in my life. Um, and so... That's funny. When you said the bridge, I thought you meant the bridge of the song at first. <laughs> 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 well, the, it's right by the Williamsburg Bridge. Right? Yeah. That's, that's from the name of the studio. Comes Good spot, from. But too. What's a bridge? People don't use bridges anymore. Well, we'll on. refer to it as the middle eight from now on. <laughs> yeah, the middle eight. Exactly. Uh, so, I, you know, three hours later, we had two records worth of material. Um, and that was just another example of we brought them in. The bridge is a nice, great space, great place to work. You know, it was just like have them ready, let open the floodgates and let them play and just stay out of the way and just capture that, you know? So for that, we had Donnie and Oren and Desron were all in the room together. It was a, it was a big room, so they weren't super close to each other. And then we had Eric in the booth. Um, no click. Uh, it was depending on, actually, we, I don't think we ever used, yeah, I was going to Melodyne a click in later, but didn't, actually didn't end up being necessary. So And sorry for for a lid short attention span <clears throat> theater here, but but Eric, which instrument was that again in the booth? Eric's a drummer, Eric McPherson. Okay, great. So you separated yeah. the drums. All right. Yeah, he was in the booth and everyone else was in the room. So there was bleed, but whatever, you know, like part of sampling in hip hop is like the serendipity of the weird stuff that just happens when you cut something, you know? Yeah. So yeah. basically we were borrowing De La Soul's idea, but not doing it for three weeks, just for three hours. <laughs> but we got a awesome. whole instrumental cut up record called soundtrack for a non-existent film. And then we released a record of just three songs of them just playing, which is fantastic. And then uh, we took one of the songs from soundtrack and brought in, Master Ace, who is just a legendary MC and lyricist, like in that hop upper echelon with Big Daddy Kane and Rakim and yeah. KRS One, all those guys. And actually, the first thing he wrote for me, I rejected, which was it was a tricky phone call. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, 
the thing was like with the band, I didn't really say anything. So I'm like, I'm going to try this with Master Ace also. And he wrote this relationship song, which was killer, but just not really what I was looking for. And so right. I'm like, okay, let's talk about what I'm actually looking for. And then he just wrote Home in America, which is just like a mind blowing song. And I think I just got a text. The video is done. So there's a video coming soon. I'm sure it'll be out by the time this podcast drops. And uh, yeah, Mass Days just blew my mind. Just wrote this incredible uh, treatise on the history of race relations in this country. Really, Yeah, it's really cool. Mm. I was checking it out just before. Um, and and he's great. And I, I know him from, I, I was a big fan of um, De La Soul. I mean, excuse me, um, uh, uh, the brand new Heavies did a record called exactly. Heavy, Heavy Rhyme that he was on. Volume one. Yeah. Actually, I wanted, I wanted this so to good. be Heavy Rhyme Experience volume two. Like, I still oh, want that record to exist. <laughs> Invite me next time you do that. Just make sure I'm there. I'm in. Nice. But yeah, that was actually my introduction to Master Ace also, that uh, Wake Me When I'm Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good track. Um, well, very cool. So let's see what else, um, what else, you know, did you learn about that session? Uh, what'd you learn about recording? Did you record Mass Days, his voice in your studio when he came I in didn't. to do the track? This was all, this was all during the pandemic. Well, the, the original session was in 2019, but by the time we got to Ace, this was like full on pandemic. So, so no, he just emailing stuff back and forth. Kind yeah. Of and yeah. we just ended up using his demo. He never even recut the vocal. Nice. Um, <laughs> you have caught a lot of hip hop vocals, though. A lot of rap stuff, a lot of MCs in your time, I believe, unless everybody's been sending you uh, voice tracks for decades. Um, tell us what you've learned about your approach to doing that. How, how is that any different from recording a, a singer on a song, for example, or is it the same? I really treat them all the same. You know, um, I think the, the approach is more different in the mix where you you know you don't you're not going to use a lot of reverb and you want to have a close close voice and you want to make sure the ad libs are really um, emphasizing the parts of the song that the that the the rapper has written and Ace did some great ad libs and he has this little especially like the 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 high high voice which kind of makes me think that it's like him as a kid you know kind of like on his shoulder. <laughs> kind of thing it, it so you know cl1b and uh turn it up that's the blue dude right the blue yep. compressor yep yeah those are cool i don't know why that's the one for hip-hop but it is and it works <laughs> all right good to hear man good to know uh that's a nice it's always good good to hear little tips like that um let me see here's something else let's let's talk about your band some more too mudville Sure. Which we talked a little bit about you doing the band thing and, you know, the frustrations of wanting your band to be the biggest band in the world. And then maybe it doesn't turn out that way and yeah. you, you rethink it, but you guys were doing great stuff and great records and it's got, um, Thank you. it's, it, I, how would I describe it? It's like, comes out of that style of, of things that might be loop based, some programming, um, sample based, but it's, you know, deep low end, uh, you know, with big, huge bass, but also a voice on top, female voice, I believe. Um, yep. I, which I don't remember if it was always that way, but you know, the band, yep. a reference that comes to mind from that time, of course, is Portishead too. You guys were in that. Yeah. That one comes up a lot. That yeah, genre. for sure. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that. I mean, like what, what were some things you learned about making that kind of music? And then as far as the deep low end and getting that kind of sound and even just knowing when you've got it right, when you're checking your mix and stuff, what would you like to share about that? Oh, wow. Um, so the way Mudville worked is that Marilyn Carino, she was really the primary songwriter and she wrote a lots of great songs and Basically, every demo she would give me would it would sound like the obvious song on the Whirly. It was like every single song was just like quarter notes on the <laughs> on the Whirly and uh, her singing. And then that thank, basically thank just, you, John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> that um, well, I'm talking about uh, oh my god, Super Tramp. Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> um. So that basically gave me a blank canvas, you know, to work with. And I've always been into hip hop since I was a youngin back in the early 80s, 
back when uh, pop radio was playing, you know, in New York was playing like UTFO and Grandmaster Flash and all that kind of stuff um, back when I was a little kid in the suburbs. And were you growing and, up outside New York? Yeah, I lived in the city till I was seven. And then we moved up to Westchester County, just north of the city. Okay, cool. Um, that's where I, you know, and then I would be taking the train into the city every day when I was in high school and going to all the record stores, none of which are there anymore. West 8th Street used to have like a million record stores and I don't think there are any left. Uh, same block that Electric Lady's on also. Um, so yeah, I grew up in New York and went to millions of shows and, you know, I was just into music when I was a kid. Um didn't really have any bands that went anywhere in high school or anything, nothing like that till college. And actually, I didn't even start playing bass till I was 20 at Oberlin. Um, so I was playing piano before that. I switched to bass when I was 20. Just one of those things. My life just kind of goes where it goes, and I just try to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of doing that myself. So to get back to Mudville, um, well, the low end, that's, that's from mixing it on a Neve desk, I think, <laughs> a lot. And um, uh, that's just my aesthetic. You know, l l you mentioned the low end theory, Tribe Called Quest, like all those early 90s hip hop records. That's like, you know, the golden age of hip hop and the golden age of me being 20 or whatever I was, you know, right at yeah, that sweet yeah. spot. Um, so that was my aesthetic, those kind of beats. And Marilyn and I had started playing together in San Francisco. We met in San Francisco in the 90s and we both moved to New York together and that turned into Mudville and we made those three records. Um, and it was the same thing. It was like each song is its own world, you know? On the second record, we were able to get some great players. Like we got, we actually had Mike Mills from REM came in and played piano on the first song. Wow. <laughs> but he was <laughs> and, playing uh, drums with, with REM, right? Mike, he's a bass player. Oh, he's a right. bass player. Sorry, yeah, 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 and and background vocalist. And so he, uh, fortunately, we didn't pay for it because it would have been our entire budget. But he like flew up on a private plane and <laughs> that's amazing. Came man. and played this track for us. That's and amazing. then I combined him with uh, Karsh Kalei, this great tabla player, and Michael Blake, the saxophone player, um, and Mauro Rafasco, percussionist. You know, just put all these, just try to put all these different things together and get to something new, which is kind of my whole goal in life with everything I do. Well, I think one of your strengths is that you're, you're a super genius of remembering everybody's names and pronouncing them right. So, well, <laughs> well, well man. better you know, than me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band. But the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version were they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Samply comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming high quality mixes so that your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or the computer back at the studio. All mix comments are time stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion and everything is easy to find in one location no more missed mix messages from the band phew sign up for your free account with two projects now at samplyaudio.com and use the coupon code rsr20 to get 20 percent off for the first three months when you're ready to upgrade hey 
Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Ben Rubin, joining us from House of Cha Cha in Brooklyn, New York. Ben, are you hey, ready hey. to jam, my brother? I am ready to jam always. So, one of the artists that you had the honor of working with is Theo Blackman. And I wonder if you wanted to tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, I'd love to. This is actually uh, maybe a record that might be out by the time this podcast comes out. It's, it's, um, Theo is one of the best singers I've ever met. He's one of the best musicians I've ever met, I should say, because he can play the piano and he's a composer also, but he can sing anything, any style. I mean, he's just this fantastic musician and he asked me to work with him on this record. He had an idea that he wanted to do a disco record as tribute to all the people we lost to AIDS in the 80s. And so it's a disco record in terms of the songs that we're using, but otherwise there's no limits. So we're going to, it's kind of going to be like a fractured disco record. Um, kind of in the same way that I was working with Marilyn and Mudville is that Theo has just been sending me these, like him singing and playing piano. And now I'm starting to, you know, I'm like, I'm going to put an 808 on that. <laughs> or, nice. you know, like, what's the weirdest thing I can do to this? You know, how can I take this to a place that no one ever thought it could go? Now, when that, you do that, do you bust out an, uh, a genuine 808 or do you go into plug-in land and find sounds? Yesterday, I bought a plug-in called Bass Engine 2 because, um, and it's it's great because like I needed, I just want to do an 808 bass line. So I didn't want to mess. I have tons of 808 samples. I don't have an 808. I have my MPC and I have a TR626, but hardware is just a pain in the butt most times. You know, I think these days, like I'll make a beat on the computer and then I'll put it in the MPC and, and print it out that way just to get those, the great. A to D conversion that's in those things. Well, one of the um, nice things about plugins is they let you do the the um, changing eight oh eight notes and follow the bass line. Right? Yeah, I was just looking. I was looking for a plugin that did eight oh eight, but laid it over the keyboard at the right pitches. A bunch of them I'd play an A and it'd like sound an E, and I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't help me at all. Even this one was slightly flat. I had to tune it up even from the the stock plugins, but they have, you know, there's like 80,000 different presets of different 808 sounds. So, you know, I just got to get there fast, especially at this stage when, you know, we're, we're just making demos. So I just got to get there fast. You know, I may go back and replace everything. I don't know, you know, or it may just be fine. And, you know, no one ever was thinking about the snare drum sound. So no one, you know, I mean, people, people are thinking about 808s probably more than snare drums, but, um, you know, yeah, I just, Bought this forty dollar plug in yesterday. I'm working in Logic, and it's only a AU VST, so um, that's where it needs to stay. Although Meta plugin is great for bringing in VSTs into Pro Tools, so uh, I highly recommend that for anyone who wants to bring those into the Pro Tools environment. Okay, so that's like a little uh, a wrapper box that you can load. Yeah, DDMF. There's a there's a plug in. There's a just a regular effect version, and there's a VI plug-in I, they, they come together as a bundle but okay, um cool. so there's a bunch of there's a bunch of good vis that are only vst like the key base the martin martinic key base is awesome plug-in the the um oh no the the Ceri the cherry audio one is ax i think but there's a there's a dx7 plug-in nice <laughs> you, you really want to go back to my bar tones. mitzvah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> Well, it's interesting because, you know, you talked about needing to work fast. And I was at lunch yesterday, I was, I was discussing with my intern about the difference between trying to get everything just right in a recording and the times where you don't, you don't get to where you thought everything was just perfect. And then later you discovered that it all, that it has a kind of a magic to the final result because there were things that just sort of happened and added up just so. And, um, yeah, and I was speculating exactly. that, so then the next question was like, well, how do you get there? You can't, you can't intentionally try and make things imperfect because that doesn't ever seem to work too great either. <laughs> so then it's like, one of the things you can do is you can put yourself on a time, you know, a time on a clock. You could be like, got to get this done right now. Do some, do the quick thing, move on, do the quick thing, move on. 
And sometimes that does allow you to discover like, oh shit, that sounds great. You know, or like the fact that we didn't perfectly line up all these instruments now has this magic to the way the band comes together or whatever. Well, the first draft of anything is an interesting thing. And, you know, having kids who are learning writing, uh, my, my son came home and he's like, check it out. Look, I did my sloppy copy, which is what they call the first draft there, you know, and it's, Every, it's way easier to edit something that's already on the page, but staring at a blank page is hard. So you really just need to get out of your own way and get some ideas down. Will they all stay? Who knows? You know, it's when you're making a record, the way I make a record is often I throw a lot of stuff at the wall and then take it all the way until there's nothing left to take away. And then you're done. You know, yeah. um, so the less you can edit yourself on that first draft, the better, even if it's crap, whatever, even if it, you know, just get the idea down that that's how I work, you know, and it's, and just hope your computer doesn't crash. And that's <laughs> yeah, part of why I've been go. part. One of the reasons I've been working in logic lately is it handles VIs better and, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. It, it's pretty well. All right. Well, for. I'm going to circle back to the logic stuff because we get more to talk <clears throat> about there. But another project that you also worked with <clears throat> is a band called Lower Heart Businessmen of or Lower Power, excuse me, Businessmen of the Heart, which is like an awesome heavy rock and roll record, which is you know in contrast to hip hop and jazz stuff that you're doing and money. Yeah. And and, um, and yet I'm listening to it. I'm like having done a bunch of rock and roll myself over the weekend. The big struggle for me is always like, how do I make things in your face, but then not later be like, I can't listen to it because it's so harsh. So what do you feel like you learned about how to record a band like that and mix it with distorted guitars, but not end up with something that's harsh where you can't really turn it up? Mm, great question. Um, well, that depends on your signal path, how you're recording it, the room you're recording it in. We, we actually did, that record's called One Planet at a Time. And we actually did the basic tracks for that entire record in four hours in a, in the drummer's rehearsal space. You know, he's got his like Pro Tools 8 on an old laptop. You know, like we actually just did another record two weeks ago and, and that one took five hours. But um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but uh, and, and the drummer's my, cool with us all coming over to record our next record in his basement studio. I'm sure he would be. He's actually really <laughs> good at it. He, he I mean, he did the recording. So um and we even did the vocal. We do. We use no headphones with the vocals. Pat was just singing through an SM7, and it was just like point the SM7 away. You know, the null, null, point the null at the drums as much as possible. Wow. But we just did the whole thing, no headphones. I think the band had only played together for about eight hours total at that point. Also, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think the no headphones <laughs> thing might be a real key to that kind of sound too, because then people are like, like you said about the lot smalls. Um, recordings they're playing the room well people just react differently in headphones than they do to playing without headphones like they're used to when they're playing a gig it really just changes it up so if you can avoid headphones to me that's always a good thing because you're just going to react to the other players the way you normally would where and then you're not spending like half an hour trying to get your headphone mixes together you, you know, know what you know what's funny about that when we recorded this weekend there was one turn that turned one tune that turned out really great, and I just realized that that was the only tune where I said, "Hey, you know what? I, I it's just like the guitar and the drums, and Dave, you know, Dave, I won't hear your bass part while it's tracking. I'll hear it on playback. But why don't we just take our headphones off for this one song?" And it turned out great. So yeah, keep going on that idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I I've worked a lot with Gene Paul, the mastering engineer, the son of Les Paul. Um, and Gene was also, you know, worked at Atlantic in the seventies doing, he recorded like Roberta Flack and he was telling me a story about the mag uh, modern jazz quartet coming in and he had just, he just, he's just like, just set up like you're playing a gig. And they were kind of like, what really? And, you know, they just had a great session cause they just set up and played. I mean, for live music, you want it to feel live and you want you know, you want the band to be playing like they're at a gig, you know? So not having headphones, having it, you know, loudspeakers in the room and stuff. If, if you, if you put the mics in the right places, it can still be done, you know? And now 
with stuff like music rebalance, RX music rebalance, you know, like for oh, this man. next record, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have that for the first record, but we have it now. So for Pat's vocal, uh, Pat Dougherty, by the way, who wrote all the songs for lower power and is also a fantastic pianist. Um, so, you know, music rebalance takedown uh, for, for effect sends, I'm going to have to pull, pull the band out as much as I can to send it to delays and stuff, because whenever we mute the vocal, like most of the sound of the record goes away. <laughs> so wow. like yeah. there's so much of the sound of the recording in the vocal, which is fine, but I don't want to be sending the drums to my vocal delays, for example. So interesting. So, so the, um, the, while soloing an individual mic in a recording like that won't give you the result you want. So in other words, if you solo the vocal mic, you're not going to just get the vocal enough to use that in the delay or the reverb, but but by mixing it all together and then using a plugin like Isotope Re Rebalance, um, you can actually extract the vocal in a better way for a sin. Yeah, exactly. That's wild, you know, man. You know, I, I wouldn't take it out all the way because there's still artifacts and I'm, I'm actually kind of disappointed there was not a new version of Music Rebalance in RX-9. <laughs> ah, well, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it, might, it may come. You know, it's uh, still, but but it's, it's interesting because like you think of the rebalance thing as something that you would use just to like uh, create a vocal up mix where you screwed up in the original mix. But this mm -hmm. is really cool to hear you talk about using it in a much more clever like production capacity. Like you can actually remix sending effects and stuff like that. I mean, uh, if I had that if I had that plug in for all those smalls records I did with when there's just like ride cymbal pounding the piano mic for the entire time. My God, that would have been great. You know, I was like panning. I was using like pan EQ and frequencies to like pan. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of trickery <laughs> involved yeah, there, but to yeah. if I'd had that, that would have been, would have been great. But yeah, I wonder if you could use it also to extract kicks and snares for re-triggering stuff like that. Or maybe there's yeah, other one, uh, other stuff that already does that. Yeah, um, well, well, let's keep, let's keep moving. Well. So what else about um, anything in the mix process for a lower power that you feel like helps keep it, you know, listenable? Uh, if you're worried about harshness, you know, um, low pass stuff, <laughs> um, a lot, a lot of low passing, you know, really just balancing the highs and the lows. And I can't remember if I had soothe for that record, but soothe is, some serious voodoo. All right. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I keep hearing about Soothe and I still haven't used it, but. Oh man, soon. you know, for like harsh saxophones or anything harsh, it's like, it's great. I, I highly recommend that one. That is, that is a great tool. Well, you know, and the low pass thing, I mean, I feel like that's part of um, something you explored in uh, Mudville. And I thought I even had a question about that somewhere. Um, I did. I think I did. But but it was that idea of, yeah, I did, like here, uh, Mudville, Hero of the World is a beautiful yeah. combination of dark rhythm section against a clear top and the vocals. Yeah. And so how important is it for that tonal contrast in production? And it, that was in my note to myself, too, too was thinking about the record uh, Dummy by Portishead. But yeah. you really did it in that one where it's like the band mm. is this dark... Um, you know, well, that, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. Contrast. Contrast is the name of the game. Contrast and limitations. If, you know, I, I was lucky enough to do a mix with the masters with Chad Blake about seven years ago. And I think that was the biggest thing I took away from it was, was those two things. You got to have limitations. That's like a reason to work on tape now would be for that, you know, um, and contrast, everything can't be everyone, everything can't have the same frequency characteristics or the, especially in the highs, it does build up and get harsh, especially if you're using modern gear. Yeah. So sometimes with a band recording, it might be record it. And then at the mix stage, start really identifying, you know, which, which of these instruments do I need to hear the top end on, you know, with a rock vocal, there may be you know, the high end may be in the vocal because you're adding distortion and stuff like that too. So maybe mm -hmm. the cymbals just need to get rolled back. That, that feels like such a, a hard lesson to learn. It's like, wait, I'm going to take the high end out of the cymbals on the drums, but it can yeah, be a good I thing mean, to do. 
especially on a, on a recording where there's a lot of bleed and you might be getting some of your sound from other mics anyway, for sure. Um, but you know, there's also like a front to back thing with, with bringing in highs and low you know, highs, especially, you know, if you want to push something back in the mix, then taking out some highs is a good idea. You know, I, I'm really into spectral sculpting. Sculpting. When we, when we talk about my mix spectral template. Spectral scalping. <laughs> sculpting. <laughs> spectral scalping. That's something else. The music, I heard uh, the music industry was vicious and cutthroat. But. <laughs> um, every single one of my aux buses that are all sitting there ready to go in my mix template, I have like an F202 in slot one and slot 10. You know, I'm ready to cut off something going into my processing and ready to cut off something coming out of it. Interesting. All right. What's the what, the F202? Which one is that? That's the McDSP filter. It's, you know, one of the oldest plugins on the market. Just, but, just, you know, just cutting off lows and highs. All right, great. great. That occupies my, you know, EQ slot in Pro Tools. And, you know, the, and you're right putting there. that on the track itself or you're putting that on an AUGS that is sending to an outboard piece of gear? In this particular case, I'm talking about putting putting them on the auxes and just having them having them there ready in case in case I need them. But you can do it on the track too. You know, it. it well, it let's depends. talk about that setup. So that means if I've got a vocal track, it's got its own track, and then mm -hmm. there's a send to bus one, and then bus one gets its own aux fader as well um, in the mix that I can put some plugins on, and yep. then sends over to the plugin. Or is that is that something that is the filtering something you might be more inclined to do with outboard gear? Hmm. I I don't have outboard filters actually. So so it's uh, filtering. My, on my the outboard plugins. gear is more f uh, for problem solving. I'm using plugins for sure these days. Even if I'm you know I have a whole sixteen sixteen in and out links that's hardwired to a bunch of this hard this gear. So you know I'm just I'm just inserting it right in like a plugin, but um. On every aux channel, like if I'm sending it to a reverb and I know I don't want the bottom in that reverb, I'll just chop it off before it even hits the reverb, you know, like on the aux end though, not, not right. coming from the channel. Cause I might want, I probably want that, some of that low end in the track itself, but that stuff just, you know, anything below 300 in a reverb is often muddy unless it's a bass instrument and you want some of that for some reason. But that's also different than just putting the filter on the, um, well, what, so if you're putting a reverb on on an AUX track, maybe maybe I am thinking about this right. So you put the reverb on the AUX track, maybe it's on the second plug-in exactly. slot, and the yeah. first plug-in slot is the low cut. Okay, got it. F202, yeah. Right, right. Got you, got you. Okay, Ready dig it. Go. All right, Colin, that makes sense. please put a phase button on that thing. <laughs> I've been asking him for years. <laughs> Excuse me, polarity. Hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a, a, a fun one. So um, I was looking for a simple phase flip, um, a polarity flip the other day. And I thought to myself, I was like, why isn't, doesn't anybody just make something that's nothing more than a polarity flip? Flipper. And flipper. I found flipper. I don't <laughs> yeah, remember who makes flipper. it, but, um, check it out. It's, uh, it's, it's refuse. Yeah, that's it. I they make low right. ender and flipper. they make flipper. Yeah. I love that thing. But it's, it's really great. handy. And then, then without even opening the plug in, you can just glance at your, session exactly. and you can see if it's if it's turned if it's on then it's flipping. It's off. Yeah, and if yeah, it's exactly. bypassed it's off exactly yes flipper but I it does use thing. up a slot so you know what it you does gonna... you know um until pro tools gives us our own uh um polarity button i guess we'll, we'll make do with that so exactly which brings <laughs> up another topic you said you started using uh you've been using pro tools for years but you've started also using logic a lot more and you've got a ton of other stuff to talk about so why don't we start talking about that if you're ready? Sure, let's do it. You've got um, some of the stuff you mentioned, like Soundflow, Keyboard Maestro, Touch OSC. This stuff gets me excited. So where do you yeah. want to start? Well, um, let's start again from the the, the thirty thousand foot view, which is mixing is an emotional job. It's your job is to enhance the emotion of the track that you're working on. And that is a different brain space than the technical brain space, right? So I always try to set up my mixes 
not on the same. I don't try to. I try to not set up a mix and then just start mixing it. I try to set up a mix and then come back to it in a day or two. Um, so when I'm mixing, I'm just thinking about the emotional part of it. And a big part of that for me is I've I've been using Pro Tools for I don't know 21, 22 years now forever. Version six six point seven I think was my first version of Pro Tools. Um, so I've gotten deep into custom macros and t- custom control surfaces to do all the stuff that takes several steps in Pro Tools or is just not readily available. So I can stay in the emotional state and not be thinking about anything technical. So, you know, the second that you have to open the new tracks dialog, decide what kind of track, how many, is it going to be mono or stereo, you know, name it, open a plugin. Like by the time I do all those things, I've forgot, I've literally forgotten what I was going to do. (laughs) <laughs> that happens right? to me every time I walk up or down the stairs. Like, <laughs> I race up the stairs to do something, you, and then I get up there and I think about something else. I'm like, shit, I forgot why I came up. Yeah, there. yeah. So it's not a good place to be when you're mixing. So lately, I've really gotten into SoundFlow, which is an excellent, excellent piece of software. So now I'm one button away from making a track inactive or making a track inactive and hiding it. Or, yeah, tell, tell us what SoundFlow is. SoundFlow is a macro system that uh, has somehow figured out how to map all of the UI features of Pro Tools. And it's you can do all kinds of stuff with it. So like my session prep used to take an hour. Now it takes five minutes because because of SoundFlow, I can... I can select all my drum tracks and hit a button and it moves it into my drum bus folder, changes the color routes it to the folder and so you know that's if somebody gave you tracks to mix or something like that or you you finished recording and now you're ready to set up your mix template yeah exactly when i'm bringing stuff into my mix template um everything's color coded and so those things used to take a long time and now it takes like five minutes it's like five clicks on my virtual stream deck um and uh it's all ready to go so stuff like that tedious tasks i mean you know, now now I'm using, since I started using Logic, I'm using the ARA and Melodyne. You know, Pro Tools doesn't have that, but uh, Andrew Sheps made some macro that does all that for you and imports it, deletes the extra track because you got to do the commit to get it in there quickly. You know, whatever whatever workaround we have in Pro Tools, Andrew has made a free macro that just makes that really quick. And also on the other end too, bouncing the the uh, process version out. So stuff like that just just really saves a ton of time. Even something like I can put a a cursor between two markers and hit a button and it will highlight that section and open up my edge tool. So I can just like raise a level in a section really quickly or just, you know, add a a mute to a, a delay throw or whatever I'm doing. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Just like Just things that make the workflow much quicker and keep you in the mixing. The STX100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, AM, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 in a single 500 module. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dow with the STX mic pre's, BBDI, and complimenters. Go to Spectra19. 1964.com or call 801-797-0642. O 
OWC now brings you the Mini Stack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander. Perfectly sized to seamlessly stack with the Mac Mini and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB-C ports enable you to connect millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or a mouse. Now the possibilities of how you can use your Mac Mini are limited only to your imagination. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at MacSales.com slash Rockstars. All right, so let me ask you this question, because I, I, that stuff has always gotten me excited, and I have spent time in Keyboard Maestro, and there was another one, something like iKey 2 was one I used mm-hmm. to use. I do use Keyboard day. Maestro as well, although and I'm migrating to uh, SoundFlow. To more SoundFlow. Okay, so that's yeah. basically, those are all macro programs, Rockstars. They're all programs that will allow you to program carefully lay out a sequence of steps so that it will automatically do it for you with a single button, right? So the challenge there was knowing when to be in the workflow myself in the moment, when to stop the workflow to start writing down, you know, something that needed to be programmed as a macro or when to come back and program it as a macro. What are some tips you've learned for your own workflow where you're like, now is the appropriate time to create a macro for this and now is not the appropriate time to create sure. a macro. Um, that's the kind of thing I do at night when I'm tired and I can't work anymore because my ears don't work and you know I'm not hearing any more highs and I'm not ready to go to sleep. And apparently I have some self-diagnosed OCD. And so, you know, I just keep a note in Apple Notes of updates to my mix template, updates to SoundFlow, you know, there's like a whole list of different things that I'm Like Like I'm when updating. you think of it, you're working on something, you're like, shit, man, this would be so much easier if, and then you just take a note. Yeah, exactly. Later, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if I could open this aux channel, enable it, and then close my stream deck in one button? So, you know, now I can do that. So now, now I hit one button, all my reverbs come up on a virtual stream deck. I click the one I want. It goes away and opens the, opens the the aux channel for me. So stuff like that, just, you know, to, to, to keep it, keep it flowing, you know, just got to keep it flowing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that's great stuff. And then, um, what are some dangers when you're creating a, uh, macro What are anything, anything to watch out for anything that will like bite you in the ass if you do it wrong? Or is it pretty, pretty self-explanatory? No, it's pretty self-explanatory, but there, there is, there is somewhat of a learning curve, especially with sound flow, just, some macros don't work if you don't have like the tracks window open, stuff like that. It's It was made by some people who work in posts. So most of the macros only work in the edit window, which right, right. doesn't help me that much because I try to stay in the mix window. So I'm not looking at wave files. Um, Interesting. But you don't want to look at wave files. I, I find I'm always wanting to be in the edit window. Is it is that part of your process of of trying to shift your brain into creative mode and not feel like yeah you, you want to be using your ears you know I I think back to you know making those Mudville records when we're just you know we're just mixing on a desk we're not thinking we're not using our eyes mm-hmm. so you know it's it's a it's an auditory art form um, and I think your eyes can fool you. Especially, you know, something will look loud, but it's not loud. Why? Because, you know, different frequency ranges have different energies, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think your eyes can, can trick you. Well, so I, I'm trying to think about why it is that I f- feel comfortable in the edit window. It could be that, but it could also, I think it just has to do with knowing where I am in the song and which part I'm about to play and listen to, which if I rewind in my own career, you know, back on an ADAT, you just drop in markers or on a right. analog tape, you just rewind to certain, you know, times. Um, do you have a process? Do you use a lot of markers when you're mixing so that you can get to the part of the song that you want to be working I, on quickly? I, I definitely do. I have a whole bunch of markers in my mix template that come into every session. 
And then I have this this custom touch OSC pad that you guys can't see, but I'm showing Lidge and it's just, it has all the different instrument names or, you know, and then I have uh, on the other controller, I can jump to different parts of the songs and it'll bank my controller when it goes over there. And sometimes I just keep the the top of my mixer window down a little bit so I can see the the top of, or the markers. It'd be nice to have markers in the mix window, I guess, um, would be better for me. But Oops, I lost you. Sorry about that. I, oh. I, I went the wrong way with my mute button there. Let me drop <laughs> an edit in there. Um, so yeah, that would be interesting. I don't know why nobody ever really created that yet. Why isn't the um, Why isn't there a ruler at the top of the mix window in Pro Tools? Yeah, Where they could put a the universe. Fader. They could put a universe window at the top of the. Yeah, that's all we need. The maybe window. there's a. I yeah. can't remember off the top of my head, but maybe there's a pop up window for that too. But I mean, there is for the um, uh, the markers window. You can always have a little markers window there with. Yeah, kind of- I I just have all my markers, you know, intro, verse one, chorus one, whatever, you know, saxophone solo, whatever it is for that kind of music. And then I just jump around that way. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. I might try st- start trying to do that more because as I recall, it used to be you just have a marker for the top of verse one and you just go there. And then, you know, if you needed to start halfway through verse one, you'd just drop a new marker or something, you know, or drop your your cursor and you'd be looking at faders all day while you're mixing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I try to, I try to keep it in the mix window whenever possible. I know other people are the opposite, but now I know when I would be exploring things like, um, macro creating in, in iKey, which is similar to keyboard maestro, uh, some of the macros I needed to create sometimes involved programming the mouse to move around on the screen or like, you know, hitting okay on certain buttons. And if you, when you're trying to compose your macro, if you got it wrong, you got a little nervous that you were going to, you know, run the thing and it was going to start deleting your Pro Tools sessions and stuff like that. Do you ever that, run into those kind of things at all? Definitely not with SoundFlow because it's designed for that. It knows how to find the right, the right buttons. You know, it has all those UI elements mapped out beforehand. So, you know, you can just say hit OK here or, or, or whatever it is. You know, it, it's, it's a super deep it's a super deep program. So now like when I export a mix out, when I hit shift command K, it opens up a stream deck and I have five buttons. So to gain up the track, if I want to for the client, uh, or I can export, I just hit export at 4416 and it knows to rename the file and put it in the bounce file. So I just hit like one button and my mix is, you know, ready to deliver to the client. That's awesome. Do you, can you also and do you create like one where you hit a button and it and it cre- creates kind of like a a heater mix, a, a heated version of the mix, something that's limited and loud compared to just the raw mix? I mean, the way the way that I do that is I just clip gain the the mix that I did up. Okay, cool. You know, I mean, I'm I often print with some limiting on it anyway, but um, I just make it louder. You know, I, I feel like that's truer to what it's going to be than uh, another way. Although, you know, all those mastering programs work pretty well for that purpose too. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Talk a little bit about uh, Touch OSC. What, what in the world is that? Well, Touch OSC is, is a way to make custom controllers um, on iOS. But at this point, um, SoundFlow does that also. So if, if I was starting now, I would just use SoundFlow because it does everything that Touch OSC and Keyboard Maestro does also, but all like DAW focus. And they also have a store where people post up their own macros that you can, most of them are free and you can just use them. So someone posted up a macro where I just hit shift C and it just toggles metric AB without me having to open it. So I can, you know, check against a reference without even having to open it, stuff like that. You know, it's, there's tons of things on there, you know. Um, I feel like, um, I think I remember the first time I ever saw Touch OSC would have been like, maybe it was like Daft Punk was performing on the Grammys or like one of the music video awards. <laughs> and and they'd, you know, they're in there in spacesuits and then you look down yeah. and all their controllers just like these really simple block graphics that they're sliding around and spinning and everything. I was like, what in the world is that? And um, <laughs> And if I recall... Touch OSC was one of those first ones that would allow you to lay out a series of buttons on a screen and then tell them what yeah. they're all going to do, right? 
I mean, in it's been around so long, I'm literally running it on an iPad one, you know, nice. so it, it goes back to iOS five, but it, you know, it, it's clumsy compared to Soundflow. Soundflow, everything changes dynamically and quickly with it. Oh, Touch OS is kind of antiquated, I guess. In now, that sense. could you run, um, I love hearing also about like an <clears throat> iPad one in use in the studio because sometimes it's more exciting for us to think, Oh wow. We could, I could just go buy like, four cheap older iPads that are just going to have some dedicated buttons on them and have them around than, you know, trying to keep up with the latest, greatest version of everything. Um, do you find that useful? And do you think that SoundFlow would allow you to, like, could you put SoundFlow on the iPad one or is that going too far back for operating No, you systems? can't, you can't put SoundFlow on the iPad one. All right, um, all I right, can run right. it on my phone, but you would need a, a newer iPad for that, but you, you could use it for that, for that purpose. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, if I was just starting out, uh, yeah, iPad iOS apps are the way to go. You know, the the free one from Pro Tools. I assume all the other, all the other 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 DAWs have them as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I would would definitely go that way. Yeah, and it's just a good reminder that sometimes it's like you can even go back and buy some used phones that are new enough, um, exactly. That don't have cell, you know, whatever SIM cards in them, and just use them as little dedicated touch controllers. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty fantastic all the things you can do now and just I use it to keep myself in the mix and not looking for stuff you know like I'm I ne I rarely open up the plugin windows anymore you know it's just just you know I I was used to clear out my plugins because there's too many and scrolling through them but now I rarely even look at those things which means I forget I have a lot of plugins right, but right. that's a separate issue that's what that's what nighttime's for <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. so what um what so to what button would you be reaching for if you wanted to open up a compressor or an EQ what would you what would your first move be on a mix I would open up I have a compressor menu or an EQ menu and I would open up one of those and try to make a decision quickly and hit it and, and that would be on the um, Pro Tools screen or that would be on this SoundFlow iPad? It would just pop up and you have some choices of, of compressors. Well, I have two ways to do that, actually. One, I, I have one SoundFlow deck that just uh, opens up the auxes that I already have just in, inactive in my template. Uh, and now, right now, I'm developing a second deck that will just, I can hit click and it'll just put a pull tech on the next, you know, free, free slot, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's just whatever I can do to make a decision quickly and not be like staring at this really long list of EQs that, you know, it doesn't really matter actually anyway. Yeah. And when you <laughs> say you have a sound flow deck, it's nice for us to visualize this, especially when we haven't considered this yet. But it literally means like you've got one iPad over here or something. Um, I have two iPads and then the rest of the decks are actually virtual. They just pop up on my screen. I have a macro to open the deck or I actually just got a Logitech gaming mouse with a few buttons. So mm -hmm. now I, I assigned a button to a couple of those decks and I also assigned buttons for like slip mode and grid mode and smart tool just like to get to some of those things really quickly. And then I have this little button thing here that I'm using to mute my mic here. I'll demonstrate it right now. I am muting my mic. In the head. <laughs> okay, there we go. I froze the button there for a second. <laughs> all right. I mean, SoundFlow Lidge. can also control all kinds of other applications too. So it doesn't have to just be Pro Tools. Yeah, Lidge, reminder, don't, don't do uh, crazy experiments live on the podcast. Here's up. So this stream deck thing is a little USB button thing with Yeah, it's just some physical buttons. Yeah, it's physical buttons. And I think that will talk to Soundflow as well if you want to have the Definitely. physical buttons. And then Yep. I mean, I guess it's just like buttons on top of a little inside it. It probably has a little iPad anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> it's, it's super simple thing. on there. Yeah. Make and bank on those things. So what are some <laughs> other things? Now you talked about using logic a little bit more. Talk talk about that. What what's got you excited about um using that? DAW. Well, I don't know if I could use the word excited. I think I've probably been just dragged kicking and screaming. You know, I'm just, I'm so busy that I don't have time to learn new programs. You know, like I know Pro Tools like the back of my hand, right? So I've been using it 
for feels like forever. That said, a lot of my clients work in logic and they write their songs in logic because it's cheap and it sounds great and it's got all those incredible instruments. So I've had to learn logic just to work with these clients. You know, I'm doing, I've been doing a lot more, a lot of like song doctoring lately. Like people are coming to me and be like, I've been working on this for five years and I don't know what to do. <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> so in those kind of situations where you're, we're still writing, I'm, I'm trying to find a flow where I can share the session remotely. Like there's this app called Mixim or De Dropbox. The problem being that I have a lot of plugins that my clients don't. So, um, but I'm trying to stay in logic so I can see how that all works. And also the virtual instruments just run better in logic than they do in Pro Tools. Yeah. Also, it's it's fine to go from logic to Pro Tools and then you continue the mix from there. But it's a pain in the ass if you got to like go from one to one and back again and then go back to logic and make an edit and bring it back to Pro Tools and all that stuff, right? It it is a pain in the butt. And it's actually it's actually interesting that you're in a different headspace. It's actually not simple to like psychologically to switch between them it's you know everything's in a different place i've had to learn new key commands for logic although you can i've been changing some to mirror pro tools but it's a different headspace it's it really is so you know try to do one and then just go to the other well logic is awesome i don't use it as much as i want to either it's actually it's one of the frustrations about what we do is that there isn't quite enough time to really get proficient at everything. And so we often feel like, man, I really wish I could spend some time like really composing in Studio One or Logic or Fruity Loops or, you know, Ableton Live. Um, and you just kind of don't have that many hours in a day to spend every, every hour everywhere. It's happening to me now. I've been working in, as much in Logic the last couple of weeks as I've been Pro Tools. It's actually really feels weird. <laughs> But nice. um, it's really impressive program. And, you know, I'm trying not to compare it to Pro Tools. And, you know, there's a lot of things that it does that Pro Tools probably should do, but mm -hmm. doesn't yet. Yeah. Any editing tips that you've learned? I always felt like that was the challenge for me was learning some basic navigation and editing stuff in Logic. Um, anything recent you, you've been trying out? It's really just a matter of learning. To me, it's learning key commands and just, you know, I, I just want, it's just learning the program. It's it's not really that much different. It's just learning how they, how it works. You know, I watched a bunch of Groove 3 uh, videos, I think. And, you know, fortunately, there are people who have time to make these videos. Like, how do you hide plugins, you know, and someone made a one minute video about how to do that or whatever, whatever it is. So there's like, fortunately, there's tons of resources out there, but for me, it was just learning, like I already knew all the concepts from Pro Tools, so it's just learning how to apply those to Logic and also figuring out which ones it has and doesn't have. But I'm trying to do more for writing and then edit and mix in Pro Tools. The Toy Box Studio, aka Recording Studio Rockstar's headquarters, is proud to announce that it is now an official Phantom Focus mix room designed by Carl Tatz. Yay! The beautiful new control room includes Carl's acoustic lens room treatment with the PFM HD 1000 master reference monitors laser aligned for holographic stereo imaging and depth of field with accuracy from 20 hertz to over 20 kilohertz. I've never mixed on a speaker system this awesome before and it feels great. I used to feel like I would commit to a mix, cross my fingers and hope that it would translate to the real world. But now when I dream up a sound that I want to create in the studio, I just turn Turn the mix knobs and the phantom focus monitors tell me truthfully when I get it right. Amazing. Check out my complete interview with Carl Tatz on episode 50 of the podcast and discover the secret to massively improving your monitor setup at carltatzdesign.com slash mixroom dash mentor. All right. Well, let's see. Um, what else have I not asked you about as far as your mixing workflow? What else? You know, maybe talk a little bit about managing you know, how, how many hours we can actually trust our ears when we're mixing and how do you, how do you balance that out? How do you, um, have accurate judgment on whether or not your mix is doing what you w wished it would do so you can make the right calls? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because 
I think one thing people don't realize, especially younger people who are starting out, is that ears get tired. And you know, you know how you worked all night and you're like super into it and you go to sleep and you wake up and you listen in the morning and it's very, very bad. <laughs> I think a lot of that kind of thing comes from ear fatigue. And I think one of the hardest things for me to have learned as a mixer, and it's really taken probably 15 years to do it, is to learn when your ears are getting tired. Like you're working, everything sounds great. And you're, then you're like, whoa, why is the vocal not loud now? And often that's because your ears are getting tired and it's time to take a break. So I've really tried to arrange my work schedule so I'm working on things for shorter chunks, I'm not doing like 12-hour studio days. I'm, I'm working on things in three, four-hour chunks and trying to respect my ears and respect the flow so when I come back to it, I'm fresh and I have new ideas. And then another thing I've learned is don't send out your mix the same night you finish it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of a big one because I, I often find that, and this, this is going back when we were talking about before we came on the air about how back in the day, you know, it was like you mix a song a day, right? You spend the day, you leave it on the desk, you come back in the morning and you make any tweaks and then you print. And, you know, that kind of workflow doesn't really exist much in my world. Um, but I always find that when I put it down and then I come back to it the next day, I can make five moves in about 10 minutes and have like a significantly better mix. Like, it's kind of crazy how much better you can get the mix in a few minutes after you've taken a nice long break. And so now I have a hard rule. I do not send anything out the same day I finish it. It's got to wait and come back to it. And it every single time gets a lot better. Yeah, I remember hearing Andrew Sheps describe sending out mixes where he said he used to send a mix in an email to somebody and then he'd like add in a couple of caveats with it in the email. And then he, he learned to start instead of hitting the send button on the email, just go back and address each one of those caveats until they were all deleted from the email and then send the mix with just, the, yes, send an email exactly. with just the mix in it. Yeah. Hope you like yeah. it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that, that, that's, that's, that's the right idea. It's, it's like hard. Really... It's hard not to though. Cause I, I mean, like, you know, I recorded this weekend and, you know, I've got what I consider my quick rough mixes, which probably inevitably will beat my final mixes one day, you know, <laughs> but I mean, like I can't help, but like I get all excited. I start texting it to some of my friends. Hey, does that some fun, you know? And I guess that's yeah. a little different from sending it to the client, you know, a little my bit, friends don't but, have to approve the mix, but uh, you know, you have some, you have some very fancy friends, I'm sure. Oh, um, all my friends are very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, you know, there, well, there's a discipline to it. It's like, you just got to be like, okay, I'm going to stop now. Things are getting weird. My brain is tired. It's time to give it a rest. Go outside, take a walk, go pick up the kids, whatever, yeah. um, and come back to it. And every time I'm finished, I'm like, okay, this sounds good, but I'm not going to do it. And then I come back and I was like, wow, how did I think that was good, number one? And number two, you know, two EQ moves and, you know, rebalancing my gain staging on the mix bus and it's a different mix and it's way better. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to hear that stuff in the moment, but it's true. You come back and listen and you're like, Oh, that just sucks. And you just, it's like being able to quickly identify something that's wrong with it so that you can quickly make it right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. What else do you want to share about mixing? How about, um, judging low end for you? Do you have a set of speakers or a place that you like to check to make sure that your low end sounds the way you want it? I mostly just mix on my Pro X. Um, they don't have a ton of low end. Um, I'll, I will check on my headphones and I, I use the Sonarworks system and I actually sent my headphones back, sent them to Estonia or whatever to get uh, measured. Um, so it, it matches with my speakers and I have, I have my Oratones or, you know, mostly I just use one of them, but I have two. Um, and how, how is that useful for you? The Oratones, uh, I usually listen in mono on one speaker, you know, kind of off to the side. And 
that's your mid range right there, which is like the meat of your song and got to make sure the vocal's clear and that I can hear the bass. <laughs> How loud is it? Never loud. I mean, try to mix at a low volume as much as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll check on low end on my headphones too. And, you know, if I see my speakers flapping, then I know they're low ends in there. Um, and then I'll check on my phone. You know, just got to check on a variety of systems and just trust that I know my room. I've been thinking about getting a subwoofer, that all said, <laughs> or maybe a, a bigger set of loudspeakers. So quick question that just occurred to me, uh, mixing in a big city. Um, have you noticed that people who are making records and mixing in a big city don't refer to the car jam as often as people who are mixing in a more of a, you know, like... I've got a car parked in front of my place. Or maybe you do. Maybe the car is part of your your routine and lifestyle in New York, or maybe it's less so. My car, no, because one of one of the woofers in the front is out. So it's really hard to right. know what's going, <laughs> right. going on. But um yeah, I mean, there's not as much of a car culture here. So yeah, you know, it's like listening on the subway. Does it work? When Which I'm listening is so to funny because, of course, you know, it's where hip hop's coming from, too. Exactly. Bass music comes from the place where people don't don't listen in cars. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to, to some degree, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you just got to make sure it's translating. So you got to check it on different things. That's all. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, all right. Let me let me pivot to something else. Um, your website. Um, let me pull it up in front of me. It's here somewhere. I know what it is. Ben Rubin. <laughs> Dot com. Um, yes. Your website looks great. And one of the things that I dug about it was, if I can find it there, I um, thought I had it in front of me. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the discography. And you did a kind of a cool, clever thing where you've got all the album covers and you can hover over them and there's a play button. And if you click it, it opens up the little player on the side where you're still there and you can just play the music. And it yeah. seemed pretty clever up against some other websites that I've explored recently. So oh, thank you. talk about making a website. If you, if you have anything to say about that, if you, if your answer is like, Oh yeah, it was just built into Wix or whatever. That's fine too. But um, no, actually, you know. actually um, Caleb Curtis from walking distance actually designed that site for me originally. And um, I guess I had that idea, but, and he implemented, I just wanted to, I just wanted my website to look good and have, you know, an exhaustive amount of information about me so people could find that people could find easily. Yeah. Well, what's cool is the player, if I notice correctly, and I'm, I know I'm getting granular and geek in here, but depending it's on actually opening up Spotify or whatever, or like, yeah, Bandcamp or one of the mm -hmm. others. So it doesn't matter which one it's hosted on. It'll show a little player. I think if you don't have Spotify though, it might be a problem. I don't know. Okay. Maybe. maybe. But anyway, it looks cool. So that's Thank great. You. And I like <laughs> the fact that um, they, they seem like little geeky details, but if somebody's exploring your website, you don't want them to leave your website with the first click, you know? Right. So this Keep keeps somebody there. right there on the website so that they can listen to your music. Mm -hmm. um, anything else about that you learned about having a website so that it was effective for you? Just easy navigation. Just make things easy for people to find. Keep your menus simple and keep them clearly named and keep your homepage clean. What's the point of a website? Why do you even have one? Why does anybody go there? What's, what's supposed to happen when somebody goes to a website? For me, it's a business thing. You know, I want, if someone wants to look me up and hear what I've done, they can do it easily. That's really what it's for. You know, it's not really for the general public because I'm kind of a behind the scenes person really. So it's really for potential clients or anyone who's interested in what I'm doing. They, they can find out easily and see if like, did this person, did Ben work on the kind of music I work on? And, you know, probably the answer is probably yes. <laughs> nice, man. Yeah. So it's like a place for people to go and just see who you are and what you're all about. Exactly. And then there is a contact button. So that's important. <laughs> people yes. should be able Please to Please send say, me an email. Please hey ben, reach let's out. make a record. I'm available. Um, all right. Before we close out on mixing questions, tell us about your mix bus. You talked about oh top-down mixing. Is that how important is it to have something cool on your mix bus? 
it's really important for me. And I usually have a whole bunch of stuff on my mix bus. And oh, like, man. like I said, you know, it's like, it's almost like mastering in a way or just thinking of it as thinking of the whole record instead of the individual tracks, just like the way that you would sum, you know, I'm summing it down in my, my Neve 8816. And then the first thing it hits is my EQ 3D, which is the Mog EQ that I mentioned earlier. And um, I just also want to mention that, uh, give a shout out to Ken Friesen, who, who I mentioned earlier that I mixed the Mudville records with. And he turned me on to a lot of these, this obscure gear that I have is I've, I've always had a thing for trying to find some stuff that's great, but not crazy expensive. Like yeah. I have a couple of expensive things, but not a lot, you know? Um, I should also shout out uh vintage King financing on that. Those four year deals are awesome. So nice. I do those a lot, you know, just amortize it, <laughs> um, spread the payments out. But, um, so it hits the EQ 3d, and that's, I would probably have it hit a hardware compressor first, but I don't have a hardware um, bus compressor at the moment. I had I used to have an Amic 9098, but I sold it. And I think I'm probably next year I'll get a, a 500 series rack and start filling that bad boy up. <laughs> yeah, with different mixed bus compressors and things like that. Yeah, and EQs and stuff. But the, the the cool thing though is that so it hits the EQ 3D first. That just I just crank the crank the air on 40 40,000 hertz to uh eight, 8 just like crank the crank the shit out of it. Um boost the, the bottom a little bit and then it goes back in the box. Um and this is going through my uh benchmark ADC one. And then I choose my com bus compressor based on the music that I'm working on. And I'd say my top three are the, um, the, uh, API 2500, the manly moo and the, um, some flavor of SSL, um, either the, the UAD or the, Plugin Alliance BX Townhouse is great, and it has a side chain input, which is good if you got to print stems. So the then, um, so the Manly Moo is that one of the UAD plugins? Yeah, yeah. I actually Ken had one of those, and I mix we mix both of the Mudville records through that. So that's like you know two B low end. You're talking about the low end. It's yeah. like you know everything on those records was about getting some super fat bottom. And so you're going to get that with the Manly for sure. When do you explore the different compressors as an option for a mix? I mean, at this point you might already know based on the style stylistically, which one you want to use, but do you feel like that's something that at the very beginning of the balance, you just listen to the different bus compressors before you even start working on the mix to decide, or is it something later on in the mix you, you, you decide to add on and see which one enhances it? I start with them on for sure, you know, never doing a lot, just a, maybe a couple of dB at the most, um, because I mostly use compression for color rather than compressing. I don't right. really, not you know, for if the I, pump. if I, yeah, I'm certainly not looking for the, I, actually often when I need the pump, I just use the one knob pumper, the, the waves plug. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't uh, really explored that one yet. Yeah. Uh, it's great. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I need to level something, I'm using clip gain, probably. Right. When you say when you say level something, you mean like if you need the mix to be louder, you're just clip gaining it up? No, I mean like individual tracks, like if the vocal is, you know, I'm not using a compressor to control a vocal. I'm using compressors to alter the sound of the vocal and get right. the right oh, I see what you're emotion saying. out I of it. Yeah. So I will clip gain, you know, that that's one of the prep things I do is often I'll just try to clip gain things into some kind of level, level-ish place. So then I'm just, you know, painting with colors rather than trying to uh, make audio do stuff. But really. you're still going to, um, by the time you get towards the mix, end of the mix, if you need the vocal to be louder, then you're going to do a ride on the fader. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah. definitely doing fader rides. I mean, yeah. and I do the fader rides on my vocal bus rather than on the track itself. 
Okay. One of the challenges I always have with that is without audio underneath the, the well, you're, I guess you're on the, uh, never mind. You're looking at a mixer anyway. That's the beauty <laughs> of looking at a mixer. When I'm looking at the edit window, I'm like, oh, I can't, it's too hard to ride the, the uh, Augs fader because there's no audio clip underneath it for me to see if I just wrote <laughs> it up on the vocal line, which again, it's used in eyes instead of ears. Yeah. Try to use, use, using their ears is, is definitely the way to go. So all right, cool, man. Um, but yeah, definitely right fader moves are important for, you know, having your mix be dynamic and exciting. Um, but you want to start from a place where everything's level and then you're not fixing stuff in that from in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's jump into our closing out jam session questions. We'll just kind of go quick through them. Sure, but I got a lot more mix bus if you want. Oh, give us more mix bus. <laughs> Never mind. Forget the jam session. Give us mix bus. We, I, I want to get to the jam session, but uh, let's see. I use the ATR 102 a lot um, yeah. on there. Uh, and again, you're as far as going out of the computer, that goes over, hits the Neve mixer and then the Mog EQ, and now we're back in the computer and we're in plug-in land for sort of the finishing touches on the mix Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I have the... Uh, gain delay compensation turn off that track because it'll you know can get up to 15 20 thousand samples on there with all the plugins especially the uad stuff so i'll put a tape plug in on there i'll i'll then after that i'll probably have another eq use often the manly massive passive which is a great eq or the chandler or uh you know sometimes i'll just do random stuff um, some, I'm in like, what's this plugin? Put it on there. <laughs> um, I like to use the Gulfos. I don't know what that plugin does, but it works. <laughs> Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. Okay, so yeah, Gulf Foss is an interesting one. I've been exploring that too, and it's it's very cool. Have you noticed that it that you tend to find it most useful if you're very subtle with the settings, or do you get kind of bold with those settings? Yeah, you know, thirty percent on both of those both of those faders, and yeah, and then it's a great way to 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 balance the top and bottom with the bass boost and the the treble treble. Those knobs are really good. Um, and yeah, I don't know how it works, but when I take it out, it sounds worse. So I leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Do you ever sort of narrow the frequency range in Gulf Foss? So Rockstars, if I remember correctly, Gulf Foss is like AI listening to the music. And I think it divides up our mix into 300 bandwidths or something Something's like that. And then like it's manual. It's just individually EQing and riding those bandwidths up and down to to manage certain frequencies or to enhance certain frequencies. Um, so the percentage is like, how much of that do you want to do? But you can also narrow the frequency. You can say, okay, I actually well, haven't do done this. that, but you're, you're right. It does do that. I feel um, like that would be useful for addressing a problem area or something like that, like, like narrow it down to the S's and then just, you know, really tame it a lot. Yeah, see what happens. definitely. Definitely. Um, sometimes I use it on individual, individual tracks as well. Let's see then. What else do I got on there? Uh, Sometimes I'll use the UAD K stereo plugin, which uh, will enhance kind of enhances the sound of the room. 
okay. of your track brings brings up some of that kind of stuff. Sometimes I'll use the Oxford Inflator. That's um, a great another one. plugin that I'm not really sure what it does and don't really care because <laughs> it sounds great. Um, I love the ML4000. Just try to a, a touch of that. You know, not crushing it, but that's got that's a great multi band. That's McDSP um, again. McDSP again. Yep. And then on the end, I usually have the um, Boz Digital Mongoose. And oh so I'm just man, like f- Boz! Folding down the uh, the bottom of the mix to the middle. You know, you can f- fold down like whatever below eighty hertz yep. or something. Keep it all centered. And then it's got a little. You know, I, I got a little gain on there as well. And I don't know. That's enough stuff on the mix bus. But yeah. I always turn it all off and put it all back on and make sure it's, you know, it's working. Sounds better, um, not worse. That's and, key, but right? to be clear, I'm doing all these things because I want it to sound that way, not because I'm just throwing plugins at my mix. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, the, um, that's the key, I think. Um, have you discovered that any of them matter tremendously, which one comes before the other? So, for example, the, the Boz Mongoose, which... Rockstars, if I recall correctly, your mix is stereo, but a plugin like that says, hey, let's let's just make everything below a certain frequency be mono instead of stereo. Um, have you found that that uh, sounds best at the end versus like, I don't know, before something else? Well, I do put that one at the end because, you know, I want to manage the base of my final, you know, the end of my mix chain. So... You know, the ML4000, I might boost some bass on there. And then I want the Mongoose to, you know, to be adjusting that. But I mean, you know, the the order of plugins is is pretty deliberate, I would say, you know. All right, cool, man. Um, What else do we need to add? What else did I forget to ask? Oh, man. I don't know. I think we're ready to jam, maybe. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, When you started out in recording, what do you think was holding you back? Mm, knowledge and access to equipment. <laughs> yeah. It was different back then too. We didn't have yeah. logic and pro tools and I mean, an entire studio inside your laptop. My, you know, I go back and listen to the first four track recordings I did on a cassette in my parents' basement. And, you know, it's mostly just hiss. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Dude. How do you get that hiss again? We need a plug in the hisser. Um, hissy fit. Well, That's saw, the name of I my saw plugin. IK my multimedia just put out a bunch of Tascam plugins. <laughs> like, That's really? great. Okay. That's great. I can't wait to try that. Stuff. You know, there's all these vintage nineties crap converters that are now being, you know, modeled as plugins because that's a sound for some certain I'm, music. I'm, I'm going to just keep my original Pro Tools, um, TDM Mix Plus 24 system around just for the day for, that it becomes vintage again. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. How about some of the best advice you received? Best advice I've received. You should be on a podcast. That was probably good. Advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's like, be true to yourself. And if you like something, other people are going to like it. I like that advice. You know, don't chase what you think other people want to hear because that's, I mean, and that literally comes down to what your brother said on Facebook yesterday, I think. It's like, just be your original self and that's what people connect to. Yeah. People connect to authentic selves, I think. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I think for me, realizing that was also that I, I like to think that the more you are true to yourself and your authentic self, the more you're going to do a really good job with that because you know it so well, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and the more, the more likely, the more shot you'll have that somebody will like what you did because you did a really good job with it. You know what I mean? It, it comes through. It's like one of those intangible things in the music. You know, it's like you can give 10 people the same equipment and song and everything and you're going to get 10 different things, you know, because everybody's different. So um, I think people just connect to that they they people know it ins- instinctively nice dude um all right so let's see how about sharing yet another recording tip hack or secret sauce something the rock stars could use on their next session this afternoon this morning tonight 
Ooh. Well, I don't know if it's secret, but distortion is your friend. And saturation is your friend. And that's your that's your crayon box right there. Just remember to roll the high end off of your drum cymbals after you distort everything else. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. All right. Um where would be a first if you if you were gonna saturate or distort right now, what would be the very first thing you would reach for to try out? Ooh, well, decapitator, of course. All right, there you Sound go. Sound toys decapitator. Yeah. Um just does the job every time, you know. Um, but there's lots of them that do it, you know, sound it's decapitator is a simple plugin. Um, so that's helpful. You know, I, I kind of tend to shy away with, from plugins that have a lot of knobs on them because yeah. I just, my eyes glaze over and if I can't figure out how to work it in 10 seconds, I'm out of there. Yeah. <laughs> decapitator is a little bit more of like a, a gain boost distortion. Like if I was playing guitar through my amp and I just used my little MXL gain pedal, it reminds me of that a little bit more than if I, you know, stomped on a, um, a boss distortion. Yeah. It's, it's, or it's something. distortion. It's not like fuzz. It's yeah, not like yeah. metal distortion. It's like transformer distort distortion. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think they also model the Ampex 351 that I have is one of the models in there and there's an EMI and, a Neve, I can't remember. It's just diff different flavors, you know. And I was listening to your interview with uh, Reed Shippen earlier today, and he was talking about how he had, like, all his auxes on the same send so he could just go through and try them all differently and see which ones are working in the song. I, I think I'm going to adopt that idea because that's yeah. kind of a great idea. But there's just... You just got to find the right flavor that makes you... Just until you go, oh, okay, cool. And then, you know... It has the right texture. I feel like distortion and saturations have different textures. I love my Dynacord Echo Chord is an incredible saturation box. Sometimes I just run snare drums or vocals through it just because it sounds incredible. Same thing with the 351, you know, or the Sans Amp. I mean, everyone, every Pro Tools user has Sans Amp plugin, and yeah. that thing is great and super usable. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you guys a, a Sans Amp tip um on kick drums i often send the kick drum to a sans amp with the phase flipped and i don't know why that works but it works it gives you a whole lot more bottom and just gives you that oomph that is really really tasty yeah sans amp is really fun to use on drums and I feel like I used to use it more when when it was going out of the computer and treating it and bringing it back in and I need to start doing that again. <laughs> All right. At least, you know, you send it on the plugin, send it over to the plugin. And there's another one um, that I remember Chad Blake posting about uh, maybe a year or two ago called, I think it's Nimbrini PSA 1000 or something. Oh, yeah. That's another, another Sans, Sans Amp. Yeah, plugin. which has a was, phase button built into it. Oh, too. does it? Yeah. I was thinking about, think, I, was, I was eyeing that the other day. There's, there's so many. There's uh, audio thing valves. There's... Um, which other ones do I use? Um, I just got the IK Saturator X. I did that. Um, it's ancient history by the time this drops, but that 25 for the price of one nice. sale they were having. <laughs> <laughs> I just completed my IK. I think I have everything now because I just I just bought the, the Oregon emulation, which kind of entitled me to anything cheaper. So I just, I mean, what nice. a deal. Nice, man. <laughs> so I got uh, the Saturator plug-in. Uh, the, another uh, one I've got, speaking of, we mentioned Isotope earlier. So Isotope Trash. Oh, yes. That's a good if one. you want to get then, nasty, Trash is, yeah. is the way to go for that, for sure. So many variations inside there, too. And then uh, Boz Digital also made some, you know, Big Clipper and Little Clipper were a couple of yes. really good distortions. Big Clipper I, lives on my bass bus. Sometimes that's just the thing you need to get the bass to pop through in a mix. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, how about uh, let's a uh, favorite hardware tool or something physical you like having around on a session? A bass, probably an upright bass. <laughs> <laughs> um, a hardware tool. Um, hmm. You know, my first thought was my oblique strategies cards, actually. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice, man. You know, if, if I'm producing, then... Tell yeah, us what those, those are. are. 
So it's a set of cards that Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt developed in the 70s. And it's kind of like when you get to a fork in the road in a session and someone's like, this should be louder. And someone's like, this should be more purple. Then you pull out a card. I'll pull out a random one right now. And this one says, use unqualified people. So it's just like a, it's like an idea generator, you know? Yeah. So it's like, man, who can get to play violin? It's just like, go, go pull that guy off the street. <laughs> Maybe great, he can play man. violin. You know, All right, I need to like, get some oblique strategy cards. It, it's, it's in my producer kit. When I, when I show up at the studio, that's, that's one of the things I got, you know, I got nice. that. I have uh, pink heart sunglasses to give out. I got, um, you know, I try to buy some toys before the session, another pedal or something like that. Or, um, do you ever show up with a Dustin Hoffman disguise? I have never tried that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just because the video and the sound of your voice. I'm getting like, I'm, I'm remembering like how much I like Dustin Hoffman too. Just chatting <laughs> with you, man. Thank you. you got a good vibe. <laughs> um, awesome, dude. Uh, let's see. Um, how about in a business tip, something or, or a resource for the business side of what we do? If we want to do this for more than just a hobby. My business tip, I learned from my dad and that's be honest. <laughs> Very simple. Just like live the way that you want to be treat treat other people the way you want to be treated and and be honest in your dealings. And you know, this is a very much a trust based industry. You know, it's it's person to person and connection to connection. And um that's 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 my tip, I think. Nice. Be man. Honest. Well it's good to know that you're not lying to us on this podcast. <laughs> How about an organizational tip or an online resource, something to help us keep our shit together? Mm. Obviously, well, this sound year, flow and all that mixed stuff was a big Yeah. One. I just started using Invoice to Go this year, which is an online invoicing service. And, you know, um, it's taken me a long time to realize that I am actually running a business and I should, there are certain practices I probably should be doing, you know? So, this past year, I just kind of decided to get that together. And, um, you know, when I get a new client, I put them in an invoice. I know how much they owe me. I, I know how much, or you can put an estimate. So I'm like, if I know what I quoted somebody, when they call me back six months later, they're like, hey, let's do the thing. And I'm like, what did I charge them? I don't remember. Um, so keeping your business organized in that sense is good. Knowing knowing uh what your cash flow is and the other tip that, that i mentioned earlier i'll emphasize again getting those zero apr credit cards that just allow you to make your payments over two to four years depending on the card those are i mean you know if you want something that's a thousand bucks but you're paying 25 dollars a month for it it's not it's not that um it's easier to uh handle i guess I'll say. yeah that's cool that's good um and you're not paying interest on it. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Closing question. We're going to take the way back studio machine. You get to go back and find young Mr. Ruben. Yes. Who's young ben playing Ruben. bass and he's dreaming big. He's like one, one day we're going to get, we're going to be the biggest band in the world or, or maybe it's earlier <laughs> than that with your four track. Yeah. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could to say, look, here's the single most important thing to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Uh, be kind to yourself and know that even if you think you're alone, you're actually not. And there's lots of other people who are experiencing the same thing you are. And, um, it's going to be okay. I think that's probably what I would tell myself. That's, that's what I need. to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be okay, Lidge. Thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> I feel that way. Every time I start an interview, I'm so nervous. And then by the, oh by the God. time we're done, we're best pals, man. <laughs> well, I've known you a long time, man. So I appreciate you bringing me on. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, man. It's really a pleasure. And especially considering how much time you just gave us and knowing that in the context of how busy you are too. So thank you for being so on that. the podcast with us. Um, oh, let pleasure. the rock stars know how they can go find you online. Where would you like them to go and, and check it out? What if they're ready to make their next hit record with you? Sure. Um, the places that I would go is number one, my website, www.benrubin.com. 
And there you will find links to my Instagram, which is at House of Cha Cha, my Twitter, which is at Benny Cha Cha, and also a link to soundbetter.com, which is a great way to hire me. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for doing this with us. I'm like really excited to hear about all these cool uh, mix flow tips that you share with us too. And quite honestly, Rockstars, if you ever want to see, uh, you know, Ben showing us more about this stuff, drop a comment in and let us know because um, I'll, I'll bug the crap out of him until we get as much information about it as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, the more, oh, you know what? I'll, let, let me add another piece of advice that I learned yeah. um, also from Ken Friesen, I think, okay. uh, just to close this out. And that was um, when, when we were mixing the Mudville records and I was, you know, pretty novice compared to how I am now. His whole vibe was the more I can teach you, the better this whole process is going to be. And the more you can learn, the better we can do this together. And so since then, I've always tried to, I'm not a teacher per se, although I have been doing master classes lately and stuff. Um, the more you can share with other people, the better. And especially in mixing, you, I could give everybody my template tomorrow and they're not going to get the same mixes as me. So every everybody's individual in that way. So yeah, yeah. there's no reason to not give away all the secrets. Yeah. So thanks to Mix with the Masters also in that regard. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you so much for hanging with us. Great to see you. And I look forward to seeing you next time I'm up in the BK. Thank you, Lidge. Can't wait to see you, man. All right, man. Talk to you soon, dude. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rockstar i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Carl Tatz Design, and Isotope. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any individual plugin purchase, or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of plugins, and sign up for your free free account at sampleaudio.com and get two projects now. Or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months of subscription. Plus, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. Just scroll down. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Str and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.